this tiny area right here covers Israel and actually some of some other countries. Okay, the entire map, if you were to zoom out and take a look at the Arab world, what you would see is this enormous swath of the globe. And then you would see like this tiny pinprick about half the size of New Jersey. And that constitutes modern day Israel. It's a very, very small plot of land. And if you were to look at this area, like the narrowest part of the land is currently constituted, you'd be looking at about nine miles wide right here. The Jewish history with regard to the land of Israel begins approximately 1300 BCE, before the birth of Christ. Moses leaves Egypt somewhere around 1300 BCE. There are various sort of attempts to date this. A little bit later in the century, Joshua enters the land. He crosses the Jordan River, right? So the Jewish people go out here. They pass through the Red Sea. They end up wandering around in the desert, and then they enter the land of Canaan, right, which is this whole area. By about 1000 BCE, the kingdom of David is established. Jerusalem is the capital, right? This is the first that Jerusalem matters sort of in world history. Remember, still a thousand years before Christ. By 957 BCE, the first temple of Solomon is built. It is built in Jerusalem. Now remember, this is still a good 1600 years before the rise of Islam. There's a lot of infighting among the Jews. There's a separation between the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. Those are two separate kingdoms. And you end up with ancient maps that look sort of like this, right? This ancient map is the kingdom of Israel which was 10 of the tribes. And then you have the kingdom of Judah, which is the one that was governed by the Davidic line. The first exile that happens to the Jews happens in 722 BCE when the Assyrians rush in from the north. You can see the Assyrian Empire at the top of this map. They rush in from the north. Then there's another exile that takes place in 586 BCE. This is the Babylonian exile. So from way the hell out here on this map, the Babylonians come in, they conquer the land, and they destroy the first temple. In 515 BCE, there's this great return from Babylonia, and the second temple is built. In 63 BCE, the Romans take over. So Pompey, at that point, not the emperor, but just a general, takes over the area, and Judea becomes a vassal state. And Judea remains a vassal state of the Roman Empire, basically through the end of an independent Jewish kingdom. It's called Judea at this point. It is not called Israel. 70 CE is the destruction of Jerusalem. There's a Jewish revolt against the Roman government because of bad administrative practices and because of infighting and because of a crackdown on religious practice, and Jerusalem is destroyed. And not only is Jerusalem destroyed, the second temple is destroyed at the time as well. 130 to 136 CE, there is a massive revolt by the Jews under a general named Shimon Bar Kokhba, Simon Bar Kokhba. The Bar Kokhba revolt was extremely damaging to the Roman Empire. They had to expend extraordinary resources in order to stop the Bar Kokhba revolt, which is why it was almost an independent kingdom for a solid four or five years there. They renamed the area Palestine as an insult to the Jews. That's why it was named Palestine. So when people say historic Palestine, understand that the existence of Palestine was meant as a name, as an insult to the Jews, who were considered the historic inhabitants of the land. And it is first used in 136 CE, a solid 1,200 years after the Jews first enter the land at a minimum. Now, finally, we get to the founding of Islam. So Islam finally is founded around the 7th century CE. Arabs take over this land in about 636 CE. In 1099, the Crusaders decide that they are going to take back the land. And from 1099 to 1291, the Crusaders are fighting battles with the Islamic world and establish rule inside Jerusalem and inside Israel. In 1291, the Crusaders are defeated and a Muslim group called the Mamluks take over. They rule for a couple of hundred years. In 1517, the Ottoman Empire, another Muslim empire, takes over the entire area. Now understand, since the destruction of the Kingdom of Judea, there has not been a single independent state called Palestine, set up any time in here. It has always just been a territory of an outlying empire, and pretty sparsely populated, actually, because there wasn't a lot there, as it turns out. The Ottoman Empire, this entire time from 1517 to 1918, till the end of World War I, during that time, they really didn't want you settling in the land, and so they had barred Jewish land purchase. You actually could not buy land in this area if you were Jewish. Jews started to make sort of backdoor deals with local Arabs to buy their land, and so you start seeing Jews trying to escape various places from which They've been exiled for you know thousands of years back to the Holy Land. There was a constant Jewish presence here. Throughout all of these exiles, there's never no presence of Jews in, for example, Hebron or in Jerusalem or in various areas of the Holy Land. But the first major Aliyah, which is termed the Aliyah in Hebrew, that means to go up, right? Because there's a, a spiritual rising that takes place when you go to the Holy Land. The first Aliyah is around 1882, it's late 19th century, and it's mostly Russians attempting to escape pogroms that are happening in Russia. By 1897, the Zionist movement begins, and this is the idea that there's going to be an independent Jewish state in Israel. It is launched by Theodore Herzl. 
He's the founder of the World Zionist Organization. He is not a particularly religious Jew. He launches this after the Dreyfus Affair. The Dreyfus Affair was this famous affair in France in which there was a member of the French army who was Jewish. He was falsely accused of spying for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It unleashed this giant wave of anti-Semitism. He was basically condemned despite evidence because of the anti-Semitism. And Herzl decided, well, anti-Semitism is too strong a threat. The Jews need some, some homeland to call their own. In 1917, Britain declares the Balfour Declaration. This says there will be a Jewish homeland in the area of Israel. The amount of land that was promised to the Jews was actually not just what is labeled Israel here, but also Jordan, which at this time was called Transjordan, which makes some sense in the sense that the Arab states around it were going to be Egypt, it was going to be Saudi Arabia, it was going to be Syria, it was going to be Lebanon. There are a bevy of Arab states that surround this entire region. In 1920, there are Arab pogroms against Jews in Jerusalem. So when people say that there was no conflict between Arabs and Jews until the creation of the state of Israel, that's just a lie. It's not true at all. There were major Arab pogroms against Jews in Jerusalem because Jews wanted to commit the great sin of praying at the Western Wall. This, of course, was not allowed. In 1922, this is post-World War I now, the British are given a mandate over the area of Palestine. They start walking back the promises of the Balfour Declaration. And the Brits separate off Transjordan, and they call it Jordan, and they say that's going to go to the Arabs. In 1929, there's another major riot, another major anti-Jewish riot in Hebron or Hebron. The British, in response to all of this violence and all of this rioting, they decide they're going to just continually attempt to appease the Arab population in British Mandate Palestine. So they begin restricting land transfers to Jews. In 1937, the Peel Commission suggests a partition plan with control by the British retained of Tel Aviv and Jaffa and Jerusalem. And there would be like a small sliver of land Israel would get, but it would be pretty divided. It would be like this little land here, maybe a little bit up here, and then most of the Negev, which is basically just an empty desert. By this point, Jews have been moving to Palestine in increasing numbers because anti-Semitism in Europe is getting worse, but also because there's this, this nascent labor and Zionist movement, and they're really making the agricultural areas flourish again. Economic growth in this region at this time is because Jews were moving in and they were bringing their resources with them, they were bringing their know-how with them, and they were working the land. And this was driving more Arab immigration to the land also because economic activity always drives population movements. In 1939, under Arab pressure, the Brits restrict Jewish immigration to 75,000 Jews per year. The Jews are saying, listen, we have like millions of people who want to move here. And the Brits say, we're not doing that. 75,000 per year because we have to get along with the Arab population. This is just before the Holocaust, obviously. And the Arabs reject this. The Arabs are very angry about this. They continue to launch low-level attacks on the British. They continue to attack Jewish populations. World War II breaks out. The Jews, including Jews who were heavily pushing the British to establish a Jewish state and to lift restrictions on Jewish immigration into British Mandate Palestine, they side with the Brits, right? They, they form their own divisions. They're, they're trying to help the British. What they say is that we fight for Jewish immigration to Palestine as though there were no Germans, and we fight the Germans as if there were no British, right? That, that's the way the Jews see it in British Mandate Palestine. They're attempting to negotiate the Arab side with Hitler. Okay, during World War II, you have Hajmin al-Husseini. He is the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, one of the Palestinian leaders at the time, the Arab leaders at the time. And he was literally meeting with Hitler, attempting to encourage Hitler to establish a final solution in the Holy Land should the Germans be able to conquer that area, which the Germans came pretty close. I mean, you had Rommel literally in Egypt, right? Rommel was over here. Okay, so fast forward, you're now after World War II. Still, the British Mandate is limiting the amount of Jewish immigration into British Mandate Palestine because they're attempting to keep this conflict between the Jews and the Arabs simmering at a lower level. Okay, 1947, there is a UN partition plan because now the British mandate in Palestine, they want to end it. They want to withdraw. They don't want to be there anymore. So the UN says, okay, we're going to vote on a partition plan. It retains Jerusalem as internationally governed. Okay, so it would not have been Jewish territory or Arab territory. It would have been internationally governed. It's just this fragmented, ridiculous state. Okay, the, the state for the Jews would have been like a slice here, a little bit of a slice of the coastal area here, and then the Negev Desert down here. The Jews are like, give us whatever you got, right? Whatever, you, whatever you're going to give us, we will take. The Arabs instead decide that they're going to launch a bunch of low-level conflicts. So there's this kind of low-level, quiet war that's going on for about a year with Arabs attacking Jewish settlements and attempting to kill Jews and Jews attempting to defend themselves. May 14th, 1948, the British mandate officially ends. Israel declares its independence, right? This is Yom Ha'atzma'ut 
or as the Arabs like to call it, the Nakba, right? They call it a disaster that Israel was established. The leader of Israel at this time is David Ben-Gurion. Uh, Ben-Gurion is no right-winger. He's no hardcore right-winger. Ben-Gurion was a labor socialist. Ben-Gurion was very much in favor of a wide variety of negotiations. He was quite anti-religious in sort of his own persona, um, but he understood the necessity of there being a Jewish state. In their founding documents, they asked the Arabs to stay. If you read the Declaration of Independence, of the state of Israel, they explicitly say, we want to be a state for all of our citizens. Yes, we're a Jewish state, but we want Arabs to stay. We want them to become citizens. Instead, all of the surrounding Arab countries declare war. Israel is surrounded on every side by hostile states. Every single side, right? So you got Lebanon up north, you got Syria here, you got Jordan, you got Saudi Arabia, you got Egypt down here. And then there are a bunch of far-flung states that are also getting involved, right? Morocco was part of the 1948 war. You have a bunch of states that have decided they are going to invade and they are going to destroy Israel. Like they're just going to strangle it in the crib. And they're openly saying this. And not only are they openly saying this, they're telling the Arabs who are living in the Jewish areas, get out and get out of the way so our armies can come in and we can wipe the state off the map. Well, that's not how it ends up, right? The way that it ends up is that the Jews end up basically retaining pretty much everything that's on this map with the exception of the old city of Jerusalem, right? So Jerusalem ends up basically split down the middle. Jerusalem is not controlled by the Jews at this point. The Temple Mount is still controlled by the Jordanians. The way that people speak about this particular period is as if there was a Palestinian state at this point. There was not. By 1964, the Arab states have decided that they need almost a propaganda effort here. So they create the Palestine Liberation Organization. The Palestine Liberation Organization is a terrorist group. It explicitly calls for the destruction of Israel. Now you will note, at this point, Israel does not control any of this or any of this. So when they say Palestine Liberation Organization, they mean this whole thing, right? That whole thing is supposed to go away because Israel doesn't even control that at that point. And they're not calling for Palestine to be liberated from Jordan or from Egypt. They're calling for the complete destruction of the state of Israel. Okay, so in 1967, the Arabs mobilized for all-out war. And this includes Egypt, it includes Jordan, it includes Saudi, it includes Syria. This is going to be the big war where they finally get rid of this nascent Jewish state that is less than 20 years old, right? And this is just less than three decades after the Holocaust. And Israel instead launches a preemptive war. They see this coming. They destroy the entire Egyptian air force on the ground. And in six days, they proceed to take the Golan Heights, which is this area of Syria. Israel takes over the entire Sinai Desert, takes all of Judea and Samaria to the Jordan River, takes all of the Gaza Strip, takes control of the old city of Jerusalem. 